All right, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the July 11th, 2022 Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board meeting to order. My name is Rachel Zenberry. I'm the chair of the board. I'd like to introduce, uh, start off by introducing the other members of the board, uh, Steve Revelak, uh, Melissa Tintakalos. Sure, thank you. You want to come closer to them? Yeah, yeah. please sit in the front row. Good, good suggestion, Ken. Um, Eugene Benson and uh, Ken Lau. And we also have with us the um, uh, acting director of the Department of Planning and Community Development, Kelly Linema. Hello. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, the first item on our agenda is a public hearing for environmental design review special permit, docket number 3704. 18 to 20 Belknap Street. So what I'd like to do is start with um, asking uh, Kelly Linema to uh, uh, give the board an overview from the uh, perspective of the Department of Planning and Community Development. I know that there were um, several items that were flagged for some additional study in the memo that was issued on Thursday. So um, I'd like Kelly to uh, start us off. Then we'll move to the uh, applicant who will uh, be given um, you know, around 10 minutes to uh, present what you have prepared to the board. Uh, after that time, uh, we will uh, go through the members of the board, ask you some clarifying questions. Uh, we'll then open it up to the public for any members of the public who also wish to make any statements or um, ask any questions. We'll then come back to the board for a discussion uh, before deciding whether or not we are at a position to be able to take a vote for um, approval or um, uh, disallowing the, uh, applica the uh, um, approval that's requested this evening. So that's how we'll run the, the first hearing. So um, Kelly, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, Kelly Alandema, Acting Director of the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, I spoke with Rachel about this, I but as part of the overview, I wanted to address a few of the questions that we received from the community. Um, the first thing is that why is this going before the ARB? So this application is going before the ARB um, because a special permit has been requested. So special permits, um, applications that are in need of special permits are sent before one of two special permit granting authorities in town, either the ZBA or the ARB. And this is outlined in section 3.3 .3 of the zoning bylaw. Um, according to section 3.4.2 of the zoning bylaw, Certain applications are sent to the ARB based on their location um, or their proposed use. So this, this application was sent to the ARB because of, because of about four feet of the property above the Minimam bikeway. And properties that abut the Minimam bikeway are under the jurisdiction of the ARB as a special permit granting authority. <coughs> um, the applicant is seeking a special permit essentially for a residential renovation. Um, the property, as we noted in our memo, has some pre-existing non-conforming rights, both within regard to the use and with the dimensions. So first, the use. Um, like a number of other multifamily buildings on Belknap Street, this building was constructed about 1910, and that predates the zoning bylaw. According to state law, anything that was built before the town adopted zoning even if the zoning that was adopted afterward is different than what is already built on that property, whatever is built on that property has uh, what we call prior non-conformance rights. And so because a four-unit building was constructed on this property before zoning went into effect in Arlington, um, it had, the property has a pre-existing condition, uh, pre-existing non-conformity, pre-existing non-conforming use. Um, arguably because it has prior non-conformance rights with regard to the use. The ARB could determine that a special permit isn't even needed in this case, but there's a certain matter of history regarding the property um, in that around 1967, somewhere between 1967 and the 1980s, a prior owner of the property converted it to an illegal use. And I say illegal use because they did not receive or request, they did not re they actually requested but did not receive a special permit to allow for six family, for six apartments in this building. Um, the current owner is seeking to return the building from its <coughs> legal use to its prior legal non-conforming use. And so the ARB may choose under section 8.1.2b of the zoning bylaw and under Mass General Law chapter 40A section 6, 
um, that this use is allowed with a special permit if they determine that the, the non-performing use is not more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use, in which case the existing use would be the illegal six apartments. The other reason for a special permit um, that the board will, may deliberate on tonight is that the applicant is seeking relief from the floor area ratio, the FAR. And when we talk about FAR, this is really thinking about massing or the bulk or the appearance of a building from the street. So the, the building has prior non-conforming rights with, con with concern, <laughs> as it concerns FAR, in that the building exceeded the allowable FAR for a other permitted use in the R2 uh, zoning district. In the R2, there are not FAR restrictions for single family homes or two family homes. You could have a two family home that's built to 1.25 FAR if you met the other dimensional criteria. However, because this is a four family use, it's considered an other permitted use, in which case the FAR is limited to 0.35. The prior non-conforming uh, dimensions of the property exceeded that 0.35. But again, that's a prior non-conformance right. So that prior FAR, even though it exceeded the 0.35, would be allowed to continue. The ARB tonight um, needs to determine whether it will allow for an extension of that prior non-conformance right. So will the AR, the, the question before the ARB is whether or not to allow for some increase either the full proposed increase, um, no increase, or somewhere in the middle to the FAR beyond what existed before construction began. The, F the ARB, I spoke with town council about this, the ARB has some flexibility in interpreting the dimensional requirements of the zoning bylaw because of the ARB's process, which is um, environmental design review. So they do have some flexibility. They could choose to allow the increase in FAR, but they could also choose to require no increase in FAR or somewhere in between. There is another issue that's at hand, um, and that's with regard to the half story. So I was, uh, staff were unable to determine based on the materials that were provided, whether or not the top floor of the building complies with the definition of a half story. Um, Prior to construction, it appears that it did, and it also complied with the height maximum of 35 feet in the R2 zoning district. Um, this is what the ARB may choose to ask questions of the applicant of tonight, because there would be an additional, um, if the applicant is seeking to add a full third story, or if they're seeking to go beyond that definition of a half story, then they would be introducing a new non-conformance, which is likely not something that the board could allow. Um, that would be something that would need to receive a variance um, and that has different criteria than what the board is here to evaluate tonight. Um, I do want to clarify there were some questions about pre-existing non-conformities and again um, pre-existing non-conformity with regard to use, uh, the building frontage, or the, sorry the street frontage, the right and left yard setbacks, usable, usable open space and FAR. Um, of those the applicant is not changing the frontage and they're not changing, they're only making modest changes to the side yard setbacks. Um, I spoke with town council per 8.1.8, those minor changes, because they have done an addition onto the front of the building, the ARB could choose to allow those and not consider those any increase in the nonconformity. They're proposing to bring the use to its legal pre-existing nonconformity and they are reducing the nonconformance of the usable open space requirement by introducing usable open space into the rear. Um, I spoke with inspectional services and there was an assertion that there had previously been usable open space in the front of the property and that um, that is not the case. And then they are proposing to increase FAR, so this would be an increase to an existing nonconformity. And then as I discussed about the half story issue, this is a whole, that's a whole, a whole separate thing. Um, I think the only other thing that the ARB may wish to clarify, um, as we discussed in the memo, is that there are some dimensions that we were unable to determine from the applicant's materials. So the board may want to seek some um, answers with regard to the area, whether it meets a half story, the roof slope of that third floor, um, the overall FAR and how that was calculated. 
Um, and then some additional details regarding the parking in the rear of the property and whether or not any buffer between the parking area and the property lines is to be proposed. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions as we get further into this hearing, but that's um, basically a summary of what I have before me here. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, do any members of the ARB have any questions for Kelly before we move to the applicant? All right. Seeing none, we welcome you to um, uh, share with us your, what you have presented, uh, prepared for us this evening. So if you could introduce yourself and any other members of your team who might be speaking this evening. That might be the longest part of our presentation tonight, the introductions, but... Uh, that, that is fine. <laughs> My name is Don Bornstein. I'm an attorney with Johnson & Bornstein. We're located at 12 Chestnut Street in Andover. My practice focuses exclusively on land use and real estate issues. Um, with me tonight is uh, Gordon Glass, an associate in my office, did a bunch of research for us on this. Um, I see that at least one of the members of the table has removed their jacket, so I'm not putting on mine. I hope that's okay. That is fine. We are not a terribly formal group here, so. Um, and then with me tonight, basically this half of the room. So I'll, uh, I'll at least list off the folks who are sort of directly involved in the development. Um, we have Chris and Alyssa Manley, um, husband and wife. They're kind of spearheading uh, the project. Um, with them in the room tonight with us are two of their partners, um, Reggie and Matt, great, and uh, Mike Pinto, their foreman, with us as well, uh, Carlos Ferrer, the project architect, and uh, Marissa Jackson, operations manager, Marissa, sorry about that. and then uh, some other folks supporting the project for us. Um, I think Kelly did a great job sort of giving us a snapshot of why we're here tonight. I'll flesh that out a little bit from my perspective, and then I'm going to hand it over to the Manleys, and they're going to go in a little bit of the details of the project, really talk about the property itself, because that's where we all want to get to. Sounds good. All right. um, so we're at 18 to 20 Beltmass Street, um, lot area, a little under 8,000 square feet, frontage of 50 feet, um, two, two and a half story. I'll cover that in a little bit more detail to respond to one of Kelly's questions. Uh, we're in the R2 district. It does abut the bikeway, the very rear of the property. It's a small little section, rear lot line. Um, if you haven't been to the property, the bikeway is actually at a much lower elevation. There's no practical access to the bikeway. It's probably 10 to 12 feet lower in elevation than the rear yard of the property. The property itself is fairly flat. The bikeway is sort of in a, I call it a ravine in the back of the property. Uh, sight lines from the bikeway to the, especially the structure are very limited. There's dense vegetation behind the property got that sort of steep grade from the uh, paved portion of the bike roads. Um, we've covered a little bit of the history of the use here, so a little interesting. Um, an illegal six family, somehow they got utilities for all six units. I'm not sure how they got that without building permits. Um, and with the history of asking for approvals for six but not getting it. Um, but the short story is for decades this has been an illegal six family apartment. Um, right up until when um, my clients purchased it, it's back on development. Um, their overall project here is actually bring that back to its conforming use, its, its uh, legal use as a four unit building. Um, they proposed a full gut renovation. Um, and the most interesting part of this application, at least for me, maybe for the board, is that that renovation is substantially in uh, process. So rough is basically complete. Um, exterior is substantially complete. Finishes starting. Um, building permits, four building permits were issued for the project back in September of last year um, with input and help from ISD, um, with the assistance of an architect, and, and the project went forward like a project would. And um, recently, late this spring, um, the Manleys were contacted um, by Mike Ciampa, director of ISD, and asked to get uh, relief really from this board for the environmental design review. So that's really what brings us here tonight. Now I submitted a letter late this afternoon. I'm not necessarily expecting you to read it. It's mostly for the record. I wanted to make sure that the Manleys reserve their rights, and the SpyCon development reserve their rights. I'm not even entirely sure they require this um, relief, but they very much felt they wanted to get in front of this board. They were asked by ISD to do it. They're happy to uh, explain and uh, promote and even defend their project. Um, and there were some concerns and some different facts sort of floating around the neighborhood. This actually gives a great opportunity to get the real facts on the table, let people know what's going on there, sort of open up the door to this project. And uh, the Manleys actually did that physical thing, I think, today, open up the door to the project, contacted folks in the neighborhood, 
um, tried to get some conversation going. They had been doing that for some time, and I think had some conversations today. It looks like we've got at least some people out tonight, but we're hoping to engage the neighborhood as much as possible so they know the facts of this project, what's going on there, and dispel any concerns. Um, one thing I'd like to make real clear is we are not asking this board to approve changes from what was approved under the building permit. So this project is the same project as what was approved under the building permits. That's the, that's the intention. That's what we intend to complete. And um, as far as neighborhood contact, we do have, and I'd like to submit for your record, we do have two sort of short statements of support from um, the owner and one of the residents on the immediate adjacent property at 14 to 16 Belt now. So I'll just hand that to Kelly if that's okay. That would be great. Thank you very much. And we'll make sure that those are entered um, into the into the record in correspondence. Great, thank you. Thank you. And then to sort of jump into just a quick response to sort of the two points that Kelly ended with in her memo, FAR increase. So I think, you know, certainly the <coughs> FAR as approved under the building permits as this project went forward on is larger than the FAR that existed in its pre-existing state. Um, it is important to note that four family really isn't dealt with under the zoning bylaw as it applies to this um, as it applies to this district. Um, a single or two family home could be every bit as large, every bit uh, have the same massing as this project. In fact, it could have a much larger massing than this project potentially um, because it's simply not subject to FAR. We're kicked into the FAR, what we call the requirement, because everything else is subject to this FAR. So I think we do have to put a little bit of asterisk when we say we're increasing FAR because the, the way FAR applies in a two-family district really doesn't take into account the fact that you have pre-existing non-conforming uses. Um, so we'd like, yeah, and I think Chris and the uh, project team will give you a little more detail about how this um, site maxes out what the property works like. Um, and then on the half story, the answer to that one is real easy. Um, we do intend to do a half story. We're not asking for any relief to do a full third story. If there's any sort of remaining questions, and I think this is mostly an ISD issue. Um, if there's something, a zoning enforcement issue, if there's something about our plans or something about our construction that does not meet the half story requirements, then we will simply change that. That's intended to be, in fact, those plans were meant to comply with the half story requirements. I think some of it is there's some information that might not be entirely clear we want to clarify that, but I don't necessarily see that as an ARB issue because we're not um, we're not asking for relief. If the if the board wished to specifically condition that in some way, you know, we're not giving any relief from the from the half story definition or limits. That's fine because that's absolutely our intention. So I've said plenty. I just want to hand it over to uh, Chris. I think is going to give us most of the presentation. Alyssa is going to talk in his ear as necessary, and um, and we brought some boards for you, if anybody needs to get up or take a closer look, or if you want to bring anything closer, why don't you tell us a little bit about how we got here from your perspective, and, um, and what you're doing on the, on the property. Sure, thanks for having us today. And if you could introduce yourself. Absolutely. Christopher Manley, this is my wife, Alyssa Manley. Um, so, four main points that I would ask that you consider tonight um, with respect to the special permit. Um, number one would be that we follow the rules, uh, like we always do. We collaborate proactively with ISD. <clears throat> we contact the building department. We have them out to the property. We, we walk the property. Um, Reggie is our general contractor partner, and, and Matt will walk it as a team. And um, we'll ask the building department, what can we do, what can't we do? Um, we'll get preliminary um, data and information and guidance. <clears throat> and then we'll have architectural plans uh, drawn. And that's Carlos's department. Um, We'll have the architectural plan submitted, and if there are any changes that need to be made, we make them resubmit as necessary, uh, walk the property multiple times actually in this instance, and we were subsequently permitted for the plans that we submitted. Um, you know, it, it's, it's always a collaborative effort, and we do our best to work with the building department and ask in advance, what can we do here? Because we never, I mean, I, we almost never end up in a situation like this, and we never want to. Um, you know, we always want to be on the good on the good list, if you will, and we have a great relationship with the building department, and everyone's been great, and um, there's no animosity there, there's no adversity, which is wonderful. Um, 
You know, I, I think that it, it lends itself to intention. I mean, we were proactive, we collaborated, we followed the appropriate process. The other part of it is that we relied on the building department for their instruction. The instruction essentially is a building permit. We, we get a building permit because of the, the plans we submitted and um, it was clearly discussed that this was going to be a gut renovation and an expansion. It was going to be converted from six units to four units. Um, everything was above board. Um, there's nothing that we, uh, Don said it well when he said there's nothing that we're asking for that we weren't permitted for. Um, the, we've done a number of projects in Arlington and I would, I would suspect that you've never seen us on the radar. And that's the way we like to stay, so we never anticipated being. Um, the second part of it would be that our projects are designed to be improvements and enhancements to the neighborhood and to the public good. Um, as far as I can tell, the ARB is very concerned with public good and enhancements to the neighborhood and, and something that's not detrimental. Um, we respectfully submit that a six unit, illegal, um, dilapidated um, rental unit, rental building um, with a crumbling foundation is more detrimental than the current use that, we're, that we propose and that we, for which we are permitted. Um, and some of the things that Kelly mentioned um, in her memo to the ARB, one of the things that stood out to me was the table um, when it came to the massing of the property and how we fit right in the median. The median was 1.035. Our building is at 1.04, and it's right in the middle of the 14 properties. And I feel like um, I understand that the ARB, and I respectfully say that I understand that there are technical formulas and whatnot. My interpretation of massing is the overall structure and what fits into the cube, so to speak, the imaginary cube around a property, and what the observer experiences. Um, and I feel like that was a great demonstration of how the property conforms to the neighborhood and it is not detrimental in terms of, um, you know, sites and shadows and it, it conforms pretty well here. Um, this is 1416 Belknap, which is a six unit building. It's, it it's could be the twin of 1820 Belknap um, before it was demoed and, and constructed. This is 1416 here in real life. That's a six unit. This is 1315. This is the building that uh, we did buy right across the street, which is very similar in, in massing and overall experience. 1820 Belknap here is, is our, our subject property. Um, not as pretty as we would love to show it to you, but um, four units. This is 22 to 24 Belknap. I didn't capture the entire building in the picture, but that's a two unit building next to a four unit. And I mean, you can see how the massing is just, I mean, it's definitely not half the size of this four unit. I mean, it, you know, relatively speaking, it's overmassed. Um, and this is what we propose. This is the, the building in an artist rendering uh, relative to 1416, 2224, the two family, and the monstrosity six unit, um, 2830 down now. And so, in terms of um, in, in terms of the conformity to the neighborhood and not being detrimental, I mean, there are so many things, and I'll, I'll try not to list everything, but between the open space and the, the brand new foundation, the four units from six, the reduced load on public utilities, we got rid of the all of not all of, pardon me, um, a lot of the asphalt, the entire lot was covered with asphalt, bituminous um, impervious asphalt. A garage that we raised, we're creating a lot of green space while still maintaining the parking. We worked directly with ISD on this design, um, which they approved, and we try to, I mean, my team could tell you that I'm, I have that productive paranoia, I call it, I like to call it productive paranoia, about parking and experience. I'm, I'm a, we're licensed uh, real estate agents. We don't practice, but we're always thinking about the buyer experience, and that's a real estate broker. So we're always thinking about the end result and how the, the, the buyers are going to feel, how the neighbors are going to either accept or feel in general about the project. Um, I don't want to get too far down you know, tangents here, but I talked a little bit about those projects um, and the conformity. 
when we talk about, when I think about public good, I mean, we submit to the board that public good just doesn't just need to be uh, felt from a gigantic hotel on Mass Ave or a 20 unit building. It, it's felt by the public. The public are the neighbors who experience that six unit building with people drunk, being loud, partying, drug dealing. The mailman walking by and able to put his mail in a slot right up the street, right at the uh, right at the sidewalk level. He experienced that's a public good. He's part of the public. He experiences that building. The woman who's in the walking her baby in the stroller by the building, who doesn't need to cross the street because the drunk guys are on the, the stoop again, you know, harassing people, that's public good. We feel like even a small building like ours. Um, if it's being addressed in this kind of capacity, has every right to create public good. I mean, Arlington is um, is very intent on creating open space and green space and impervious areas. This project creates a ton of that. I mean, this is terrible, by the way. This is not drawn to scale. This lot is huge, and it was the garage was here. The entire thing was covered with asphalt. It was nasty, and there were there were bulkheads here. There was a gigantic uh, metal fire escape that came out and went down here. It was just, it was just terrible. And um, we feel like we've made such an improvement over the existing property. So I'm just going to give you a time check. You are sure. a bit over the okay. the time that we typically allot. So okay. um, I would just ask if you, I appreciate all the detail that, that you've both Thank given you. us. Um, but if there are some other salient points, you definitely mm -hmm. want to make sure that we hear. Um, if you could. And there, those, and that I'll, would be I'll great. Make it work. Thank you. Thank you Bear so much. Um, there's a very real, um, for lack of a better word, I'm not, I just won't sugarcoat it. There's a massive financial hardship at play here. We're permitted for this. We counted on the, the town and ISD to build this building. We we we, we did as permitted and as instructed. Um, we were financed for this building. And we don't get financed to move backwards, so there's no choice to move backwards. The only choice is for us to move forward with the building. Um, that's why we're here to respectfully request a collaboration and to figure out some way forward. Um, this process has effectively pushed us into a recession with units that are still being built and not sold. Um, so I guess, you know, to sum it up, all we are asking tonight is to build what was permitted. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So at this time, um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my colleagues on the board for any questions um, that you might have for the applicant. And uh, Ken, why don't we start with you? Well, I have a question, but I'll, I'll reserve that for later, or we can talk yep, about absolutely. amongst ourselves. We can wait. Uh, but as far as a uh, <clears throat> question to the developer here, uh, I like your project. It's, it's, it's a very nice project. It's very handsome. And I think you're, it's, a, it, uh, it's a betterment to the neighborhood. Uh, so what you've said so far, I have no issues with. The only thing I wouldn't mind asking, uh, maybe you could consider, is uh, you have uh, this green space in the rear yard. Um, it, it's, it's definitely a, uh, a bonus. But I don't want that in the future to be parked over and and, um, and um, covered. Uh, and I see something like that happening easily enough. So I was wondering if there's a way of maybe putting a curb there or some sort of uh, bushes or some sort of structure there where it, it would just limit the, um, the amount of cars. So, so yeah. to be honest with you, I lived at 14 Belknap about 30 years ago wow. uh, when me and my wife first came to, uh, to Arlington. So I knew what exactly what the backyards were. It was a big, huge asphalt parking lot that just went on forever from one property to another property. There was, uh, you're exactly right, there's fire escapes coming down, everything was just, it was a mess. And you didn't feel comfortable walking back there to, uh, toward the, the bike path at night. It wasn't safe. Uh, at least what my wife did feel that way. So I think you're doing a better than today by doing this, and I think uh, what you're doing is fine. You just if you're gonna if you could commit to a green space, I would like you to commit to a green space. 
Uh, hopefully I'm not asking too much by putting some bushes or curbing or something to, to make sure that it stays as that green space. Um, I did have a question uh, about the half story, but you're saying that you will commit to a half story. Whatever the requirements are for a half story, you're going to commit. It's not going to be a three story building. So I, I can, I'll, I'll take your word for that. And I, I also will take the understanding that the building, uh, building officials will enforce that, and, I, and I'm happy with that. Um, and then the other part that that's, you're asking some for relief on is FAR. Uh, fortunately, I believe that if, because this project is brought into this board here, the ARP has much more latitude in granting relief for that. And that's something I will bring up with my board members later because this project is brought for the ARP. We don't, we're not viewing this as a zoning board. At least my opinion, okay? My, my board members might think differently, but since this is an ARB review, we're gonna review it as an ARB board, not as a zoning board. So we're not asking to check off these different things because the reason why this is in the zoning is if any property touches certain areas like uh, Mass Ave or the bike path, it falls on our jurisdiction. And we have our set of rules, not the zoning board rules. So that's how I'm going to interpret this project as that. But that's something I, I'll, we'll discuss later amongst my board members, because I'm not sure they all believe in the way I believe. Okay. Okay, I'm just stating how I see it. Thank you, Ken. Gene? Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll discuss that later. Um, I, I have a question about the half story. I couldn't figure out, and maybe some of my colleagues could from the materials, I couldn't figure out whether what you have on the third area meets the standard for half story or not. And um, can, I, can I actually well, weigh in on that? So thank I you. did um, speak with um, Inspector Champa today, and um, the revised drawings that were part of this application, which are different than what was originally submitted, do meet the half story. He has reviewed it and okay. believes that it, it meets. What he did flag was that he believes that the height is higher than what is currently allowed. So what we have here is something where we're, I personally, I'm not going to let you go ahead with what you got permitted, obviously because the first drawing, it sounds like, did not meet the requirement for half story, but the revised one does. But as Ms. Zemberry says, you may be too high. So. Um, you know, I'm not going to agree, maybe my colleagues will disagree, but I'm not going to agree for you to go ahead with what you got permitted if it's inconsistent with the height or inconsistent with the half-story requirement. So um, we'll have to take that later. Um, what else do I have here? I have a question about how the FAR was calculated. And I think this is very important for us to figure out and to discuss later. If you look at um, the page of your application that uh, lists existing and proposed, in determining um, the gross floor area, which is used to determine the floor area ratio. Which page are you on? Um, it's, if, I don't, I don't know the page number on it. Um, if you can... 14 or 183? Uh, probably this one? Yes, that's it, Steve. That one. What page is that? Five. 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 No, no, it's not. It's a typed page. Is everybody on the same page? Do you have it? It's always a good question. Do you have it? Do you have it? It's what uh, Steve said. Do you have, it looks like this. It's after that page. Next page. Next page after that. Yes, there you go. It. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Um, you calculated it based on the first floor and the second floor and the attic and porches and balconies. 
I have a question about the basement, though. What was the basement like, or what is the basement like now in the building, or when you bought it? What was the basement like? Um, but the, exist the previous conditions were uh, mechanicals. So the basement, was, the basement was unfinished mechanical area. Just a mechanical area? Yes. Okay, under, under our zoning bylaw, um, the gross floor area includes cellars and residential units and basements, it, except not basement areas devoted exclusively to mechanical, um, mechanical equipment, uses, accessory, the operation of the building. And you have a lot of space in the basement for the tenants to use, um, according to the diagram. So, I believe that those spaces, and I couldn't figure out the exact square footage, needs to be added to the gross floor area of your building in the calculation. And the, our zoning bylaw section on gross floor area is 5.3.22. So I believe that you are undercounting what the actual FAR is for um, the building, and I, I don't have a calculation for what it is, because I don't have a calculation for how much of the building should be added. My guess is your probably FAR is probably close to eight or nine, or close to nine, but I don't really know. So we would need, I would need at least to have that resolved in order to decide what to do with consideration of the floor area ratio because you're asking for an increase from what was currently. And I'm not sure whether I would give you one or not, but the greater the distance, the more we have to think about whether to grant it. So I would need you to come back with what's the um, floor area, the gross floor area in the basement, and what the new FAR would be as a result of that. Um, I have a question, let me walk up here with you. zoning bylaw, and I didn't see anything that excluded window wells. Do you know, Steve? Uh, so the section it would be in would be 539. I didn't see any. Projections of the minimum yards. Yeah, I didn't see it. So assuming it's not in 539, I would need to see a recalculation to see whether those window wells go into the 20-foot setback or not. Because if they do, that's a whole different problem. Um, okay. um, bicycle parking. So this is a, an apartment building under our zoning bylaws, not a townhouse structure under our zoning bylaws. And the apartment building requires 1.5 long-term spaces per dwelling unit, so four dwelling units, you'd need to identify six bicycle parking spaces. 
that meet the requirements of um, the zoning bylaw in terms of where they can be, whether they get lifted up and downstairs, things like that. That's not in any of your materials, so that would need to be added. Additionally, um, it requires basically one um, bicycle parking space that's called short term, which is outside um, the building, which we can discuss whether that makes sense or not. But if we just look at the bylaw for apartment buildings, it basically, you round it up and you need one bike rack outside the building. Um, so that's on bicycle parking. Um, on the parking area in back, and, and I appreciate um, I appreciate you're trying to put all the green space in one place, and, and I agree with my colleague. It would be really nice to have something there that cars didn't run on it. But the other piece of it is um, the surface area. This is under the zoning area. Surface area 10 feet back from all level lines of the running property used for residential purposes, or 5 feet if there is a wall. And it needs screening. I know we just do the microcycles in the residence. We have not screening here. We need to do something to screen on that side. So we may have to move things over there a little bit. And for those of you wanting the citation to the zoning bylaw, it's 6.1.11 on the screening for the parking. Uh, let me see if I have anything else. Oh yeah, I just wanted I just wanted to um, mention one other thing to to contradict what you said in your opening. <clears throat> to be fair, I walk the bike path almost every day, right by the house. Now you can't see it because the trees are leafed out. But when the trees aren't leafed out, you can see it very clearly. I saw it being built. I saw this big thing going up. I kept wondering how large it was going to get. So, um, yeah, right now when I walk down the bike path, I can't see it. But in the winter, after the leaves go out in the fall and before the leaves come on in the spring, it's very clearly visible from the bike path. You can look right up at it. So I just did want to make that point. It depends on the season um, when you look at it. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Before we go to Melissa, um, Jean, I think when we get to our discussion in section 5.3.9 with regard to the window wells, B, mm -hmm. where it talks about unenclosed steps, decks, and the like, I think the question becomes what is, what is and, and the like? And, and the like. And do, do the window right. wells fall into that? Right. Okay. I don't think they do, but right. Okay. We can chat about that. Yeah. Great. All right. Melissa, any questions for the applicant? Um, no specific questions. I think, you know, coming from, at least from my perspective on it, you know, I apologize for us kind of bringing you back to this, and I understand your statement about the financial hardship, and, you know, we're aware of that, and I want you to, you know, understand that what we're trying to do is make sure that the, the permit and the process is followed to make sure the project is, you know, secure going forward. So, um, and I think, in terms of some of the things that have been mentioned, I think um, overall, um, with the ARB having some you know, flexibility with the F FAR, um, that's one thing that you know, I'll look to. I think we, for us, or at least from my perspective, um, the FAR is within reason. I think we have to be mindful of you know, kind of the precedent it's setting. Um, I think the, the project itself um, is a very good enhancement obviously um, a strong kind of investment in the neighborhood so you know, I see the value there with regard to the open space um, along with Ken's comments I support that and trying to maintain that and see how we can ensure that doesn't become just paved over in the future um, 
And you know, I think we'll talk, I mean, I think we clarified the half story, so that was one, one area of confusion. Um, where the FAR is picked up, aside from the basement, is it mainly from the enclosure of the front, or where are you picking up the additional FAR? Because it doesn't look like the footprint's expanded at all. I mean, beyond the front. The footprint expanded, uh, as far as I know, um, as far as the plans uh, suggest, is five feet to the front and five feet to the rear. It was in the rear. So the envelope, if you will, did not change. Mm -hmm. The footprint did not change. If you took a, a square and outlined it because it had porches similar to 14 and 16, and it had bulkheads and this fire escape on the rear in the summer, but we technically did expand the, the foundation and the two stories. It's enclosure of unenclosed. Yeah, so it's enclosure of unenclosed, right? right now, it so wasn't an expansion of the footprint. Though. This right here, five feet right here, is where the building used to end. And on the rear, same same treatment. So when we worked with ISD, they said we can move five feet. Does that help? It does help. I mean, I, I mean, we see that often in a different kind of renovations. Um, I just wanted to kind of make sure I was understanding that right. Um, and then I guess I do have a question, Kelly, with regards to just our, you know, our team's confusion, ISD's confusion, how it went forward, and then there was reconsideration for it to come back to the ARB. Um, do you, are you able to explain a little bit to me how that happened or what we should be noting in the future about this? Um, I mean, my understanding is that the building permits were initially issued in error, um, and then at some point in that process, it was determined that because of the increase to the FAR and because of the prior non-conforming use, it would have to go to a special permit granting authority. It was originally routed to the ZBA because the ARB typically does not hear projects in the R2. Right. Um, but during the course of that, during the course of those reviews and various individuals reviewing the documents, it was realized that it was on the Benjamin Bikeway, in which case it was pulled from the ZBA so that it could reroute it to the ARB. Um, but so, the overall, like, regarding the building permits being issued, in, I mean, that's not really part of what the board is Right, now I'm just trying to understand that for process, because I think from, um, you know, and the permit's the end result of producing a good development throughout. So we want to understand that a little bit, at least from my perspective, to help facilitate good development. Um, I think those are all my questions right now, so thank you. Great, thank you, Melissa. Steve. Hello, uh, thank you for coming tonight. I have um, sort of questions and remarks in four different areas. Um, so one, Mr. Benson touched on earlier, I was looking over the dimensional worksheets and um, noticed that the, there is zero GFA listing for the basement. Now, per our bylaw, you know, 5322, um, you know, the, although, you know, attics, we make a distinction of, you know, whether they're finished or not, but we don't do that for basements and cellars. I, and I believe you do have a cellar in this building and it is explicitly included. And so I, you know, I, I'll echo Mr. Benson's sentiment and uh, would like to see that added. Um, now, regarding the, regarding usable open space, so non-conformities with respect to usable open space are very common in town. Um, you know, this is something that was added to the bylaw in 1975 and there were just, you know, lot, there's, there's a lot of East Arlington that does not have usable open space. And typically when, you know, when treating, when treating a usable, op usable open space nonconformity, um, you know, if the applicant can show, you, usually it's, you know, expanding GFA but not changing the amount of usable open space. So the applicant will typically have to show that there was no usable open space beforehand, there was no, af no usable open space af afterwards, so it's no change to the degree of nonconformity. Um, you're actually adding some, which is, that's fine. It's not increasing the degree of nonconformity, but it would be nice to have a plot plan and where those dimensions are spelled out so we could just look at it and say, okay, so the front, you know, it would be really clear that um, it's really just like the plan that's on sheet A3. If you add it in the front yard setbacks and the dimensions of the, the open space 
and maybe a diagram of what was there before, um, you know, to illustrate that it was, you know, uh, illustrate that, you know, it was, it was paved over. So this, it's really just about providing documentation there. Um, for the half story, I'm, the general way, usually the easiest way to show compliance um, with our half story regulations is if you take the, the floor plan for the third story and just sort of box in the area where um, there is a height of seven feet or more from the floor to the finished rafters. So you could just say, okay, this is the area that meets the seven foot height limit. And then we can look at the, you know, the dimensional worksheet for the floor below and you know, make a determination of whether it's 50% or not. Um, the other thing that plays into half stories, um, and you did, is sort of like the side perspective. Um, you know, this, this one. The other criteria for a half story is that the minimum, the slope has to be at least uh, two, two to 12. So there's part of the roof that's shown here is five to 12, that definitely needs it. But the, uh, but the sort of flanks at the end um, are, are too shallow. Um, so those are, they're at least shown as being one over 12. Uh, the whole, re or the rationale behind that, um, you know, that slope requirement is to, you know, ensure that, you know, the reason it was added is to, to make sure that the sort of the half story didn't look like a full story. Um, and it, this, to me, it does, it does, it does look like a full story, but I, I do have, um, you know, I would, I do have a little bit of a, for me, the, the 1 to 12 slope on the edges is a bit of a stumbling block. Um, and so finally, yes, uh, vegetated buffer around the parking lot. Um, so this was, the, the provision I was actually looking at was section 6110A, but um, it's, it's close by. Um, yeah, and in, in terms of the townhouse versus Townhouse versus apartment. I, I, to me, this this falls more on the side of the townhouse. I, I had a conversation well, with Kelly about this. The, the definition of townhouse in the regulations is three in a row. This isn't three in a row. This is two and two. Well, I, I agree that it's I agree that it's a gray area, but no, this not, can be not um, a gray area at all. Okay. Well, we can talk about that later. I have nothing further. Great. Thank you. Um, so the. Only other question that, that I have, I think that my colleagues had some some good uh, questions for you, and I also agree with with Steve that um, I'm I'm struggling a bit with the one to twelve pitch, especially when I went out on on site as as well. Um, is the overall height? Uh, because I did speak to the building inspector, and he questioned whether in in your uh, in your table here of uh, dimensions, you show that it's below the maximum thirty five feet. Um, but then there's this new section where the overall height is, is not calculated. You have the, um, the, the height here to the uh, bottom of the, of the third floor, but not the overall height of the building. So, so has that gone over the 35 feet? Of the ridge. 33? Okay, so then I I'm certainly will not um, make an issue of that. If that is something that was intended to conform, then that would, will be between you and the building inspector. Okay, um, any other questions from uh, the board before we move to uh, public comment? Jean. I just have one other question. When I, when I went today and it, the, the building did not look like it was being built the way the, the representation of the building looks like. Can, can you talk about the difference between the two? The only thing that I can think of um, is we made a de minimis change on the third floor. If that, I don't know if that's what you mean, but there was a, a door. There was a door here. And to make the floor plan flow a little bit better, we put the door here, so we moved the door over. And we actually um, we made an improvement to the 
the plans, we actually shortened the building. The building was, was permitted to be too tall. And they started framing. Um, they actually significantly framed. And then we said, wait a minute, hold on, time out. We reduced the height of the building. So I don't know um, that, but I don't know if anyone else has insight on that. But. Yeah, let me, let me just come over. Gene, is there a page that you're referring to, just so that for record I can um, let people know because the people... Page 46. Thank, thank you. looking at the back rendering on page 46. And the front rendering. And on page, the front rendering on page 44. Thank you very much. I appreciate that for record. Yes, we originally... So we did get permitted for that, and then we realized that that would be incorrect. That would push us into the setback, mm -hmm. so we abandoned that. Okay. We caught it, thankfully. Okay. Very good. My pleasure. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to open up the discussion um, to any member of the public uh, who's joining us this evening who might wish to speak. Um, if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand. I'll call on you in the order that hands are raised. You'll have up to three minutes to address the board. Um, and I'd ask that you um, identify yourself by your first, last name, and street address. So any, would anyone like to speak this evening during our public comment? Please. Hi, I'm Laura Tracy, uh, from 25 Marion Road, um, about six houses down. And, um, uh, I just, uh, well, a couple of things. One, um, yeah, I am on, I am on town meeting, and um, I think just, just so that the board knows, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of times, you know, other town meeting members and, and myself uh, feel like there's always like, press it, like uh, special permits. And like, oh, we'll allow this much. So I'm very concerned about precedent setting uh, in terms of uh, allowing like an increase uh, in the AFR. Um, it's, it's, that's why it's hard to get, I'm all for more density uh, in Arlington, but it's very hard to get anything passed because if everyone's, you know, tempting them to say, well, it's, it's, um, uh, yeah, but there's always going to be a special thing where if you just give them an inch and they'll take a mile because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's some play, you know, with, with allowing things. Um, so just, just so you know that that's uh, part of the um, I'm coming from that. And, um, you know, I feel, I feel upset, upset that the permit was granted uh, for something that is, didn't wasn't in compliance, um, and now it's a financial burden um, uh, for the for the developer, for the owners, um, and, I, and I, I that that bothers me. Um, and I don't know um, how that happened, and you know how Arlington can make that right. I, at the same time, I don't want something built that has like just minor changes to the side setbacks or like, uh, a little play with the amounts of the AFR. I want it built to the specifications of the bottom of um, So it doesn't, it doesn't feel very good that we have something now that's a financial burden uh, that Arlington is, is um, responsible for. So it doesn't make sense. Thank you for sharing that this evening. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to speak this evening? Please, go ahead. Sure. Uh, my name is Austin Brown, and I'm one of the uh, 
group of people that own 10 Belknap. My father is the current owner and I'm in the process of purchasing it from him. Um, I'd just like to say that uh, my apologies for the poor planning. I got off a red eye at 10 a.m. this morning, so I'm a little out of it. But when I reread the uh, slope height uh, bylaw, I, I wasn't able to pull it up right now, but that specific part of the law, as I interpret it, was not incredibly clear. It said there was a slope. It sort of just had a global slope, but when you have a gabled roof, it's not clear as to whether that slope applies to every single section of the roof or the roof in its entirety. So I'd like to suggest that it may be worth um, clarifying that. And if this, uh, if the decision is made that it applies to every single part of the slope, um, that you know that will be that will become the precedent. Um, and personally, I, I think it should apply to every single part of the roof, because if it doesn't, then you could basically end up with two very flat roofs. You could end up with like a shipping container looking building, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't think is very aesthetic. So anyways, um, I could have completely misread that, and you should do your own reading on it. But uh, thank you very much for letting me see. Thank you very much. Um, and Steve, I know you spoke to that a little bit. Did you want to offer any further mm -hmm. clarifications on on the, the area um, with regard to, to slopes that might help? With regard to... I understand. Um, I, prior to joining this board, I served on the ZBA for a year and a half. And to the best of my recollection, we always applied the 2 to 12 slope requirement to every single roof surface. So if you had a shed dormer on the side of the house, the top of that shed dormer had to have the slope of at least 2 to 12. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak this evening? Please. Hi, my name is Anne Ellinger, and I'm at 21 Lincoln Street. I've been there for about almost 40 years. It's just a few doors away. A little louder? No, you're fine. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, there's been so much misunderstanding and confusion in the neighborhood. I feel like in the last two days we've had better communication than the whole you know, year before and I feel like my core interest is that people in Arlington trust their, their government, their, their leaders, and I feel like this combination of, uh, like what Laura was saying, it just feels really bad that it was like, I understand mistakes happen, but this combination of mistakes so that now we're just in a jam. I would say the neighborhood never wanted the construction to stop. That we want the building completed as fast as possible. And if we're not to be stuck in this limbo, we want it to be rented and good people would be there. And so I feel very caught between feeling like both of you did, like, let's not let not, like we want the rules followed and just to be able to trust, even if we don't like the rules, and I think we don't, it's, it's very upsetting in our neighborhood that there's a number, like more and more small rental unit houses are being reconstructed. And so it's just hard to watch the character of the neighborhood change. But that isn't, that's not what we're dealing with here. It's like, are the rules being followed? We would like them to. At the same time, it's not, the fault of the developer that the plans were okay, that weren't conforming. So how do we resolve this as soon as possible with the least amount of pain for any of the parties so it can move on but not become a precedent that then more developers build more and more ever bigger things that aren't quite allowed. So that's Thank you. Thank you. Um, so before we move on to any other comment, I'll just address that because that's come up a, a couple of times. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the building department. That's not our, our role here. Um, and I, I think we've already mentioned we, we do feel um, like you're in a difficult situation, and I think we all appreciate that. I will say as an architect, um, there are times when um, a planned reviewer makes a mistake and a building permit is issued for something that is not in compliance with a local state or federal ordinance. And unfortunately, as a design professional, that doesn't recuse you of the responsibility of meeting those. 
And so no matter when it's caught in a project, if it's caught, it's something that has to be dealt with. And unfortunately, it was just caught at this point in the project. So, you know, if an accessibility uh, requirement was missed, doesn't mean that it's never going to be added back in. It has to get added back in. And this is not dissimilar in that there are zoning items um, that were caught. And again, we're going to, um, as a board, discuss um, in terms of what we can do to help this developer make this project work. Um, but it, 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 no matter when it happens, it's something that has to, to be addressed. So I just wanted to address that comment. Richard, can I say one thing to you? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm going to address what you said earlier, that sometimes it seems like rules are uh, sometimes enforced, sometimes not enforced, sometimes not followed. I want to say that ARB is charged with a vision to help encourage the development the town in, in according to the master plan that was approved. So one of our uh, incentives that, that we have empowered is to give some relief to some of these uh, requirements to help encourage this development. So it may seem like we're wishy-washy on some of these enforcement of some of the zoning requirements or something like, for example, FAR or setbacks or so forth. But we are, as a board, empowered to give some relief to that, knowing the bigger picture of trying to encourage this vision we have. So how does that help answer the question we have? But that's how I always interpret what we've been charged with doing. I'm not here to say, OK, I'm going to give you a little relief here. I'm going to give you a little relief here. Um, you know, it's not that at all. It's how we see it. And if that project is beneficial and is and, and we want to encourage that for example affordable housing if you add a few more affordable housing units in the mixed project we'll give you relief on far or the height, heights or setbacks or whatever so forth so we can encourage other people to do so and that's that's where sort of empowered to do and that's how i sort of see what i mentioned earlier to this project here, yeah. this project now being shifted to us, the ARB, because it's on the bike path. So I'm going to view it differently than the ZBA would view it. The ZBA would say, okay, here are all the rules that you have to follow. If you make it, we'll approve it. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get into that during the discussion a little bit. Yeah, I just a little to follow more. No, I understand. Okay. I understand. It felt, when I heard that, it felt my first um, yep. suspicious brain like, oh, so now it's going there, so it's all I see whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I, we're not going to have a, a back and forth about this, but um, I appreciate you exactly sharing your, I, yeah, so I appreciate you sharing your perspective, Ken, but we'll save that for the, okay. for the discussion. Um, are there any other members of the public who are here this evening that wish to speak? Please. I'm sorry, if you could, uh, first, last name and address. Thank you. Just as a comment, as someone living on the street, there's, this may be somewhat irrelevant, but it's kind of the aesthetic issue. When a house is being redeveloped, you know, there's the question of, is it, is it meeting the bylaws and stuff? And there's also ways to make a house one back more as opposed to being more forward. Um, and I think perhaps that could help um, some of the, uh, Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> some of the, uh, you know, so for example, um, you know, putting a fence around the lot uh, while it's neat and so on, and um, it, it kind of pushes forward the boundary of the house visually, and also, you know, bright colors like, for example, in the middle house. I mean, it's, I should say that the, the house that was redeveloped across the street is an extremely attractive house, and it has wonderful people in it, and is a was an overall improvement in the neighborhood. The, the large white area at the top on a sunny day really makes the house look a lot bigger than it is. So there might, there might be just some aesthetic things that could help. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Uh, I just don't want to make, we're not going to do a back and forth. Do you have a, was it for one of the public? Yeah. Members? Okay. Yeah. So I, I have a question about this. So one of the standards that we will be looking at is whether the change they're doing to this building, right, 
is more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing building, the one that they're getting rid of. So I don't hear any of you saying that what they're proposing to do is more detrimental to the neighborhood than what was there before, but tell me if I understood that correctly. So my, my personal opinion, the house that was there before was in very rough shape. So, you know, it was really, it was, it was in extremely rough shape. So this, you know, this is good. I guess my thing is if there were ways to, especially because there is this push out in the front, which you guys need to decide about, you know, if there are ways to kind of visually back it off, that might be, from my point of view, plus I'm not sure that has any relevance in terms of zoning regulations. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Uh, what, we're, we're not going to do a back and forth. Okay. Um, any other members of the public wishing to speak this evening? Uh, you're a petitioner, <laughs> so we're, we're not going to um, entertain any questions during public comment for you, but once we close public comment, we will, um, again, re-engage in a dialogue. That was my question. Okay. Uh, any other members of the public wishing to speak? I just want to say thank you all for your time. Thank you. Okay, so with that, we will uh, close public uh, pu uh, the public comment period for this uh, for this hearing, and I will uh, reopen it back to the board um, for us to uh, discuss our thoughts on um, any items that we would either like to um, ask the applicant to return with more information on or um, whether there are any, um, any revisions or um, further clarifications that we would like or if we feel that we will be able to move towards a decision this evening. Um, and I'm going to start with Steve. So there are some things I would like to see to go forward. Okay. Um, namely, uh, taking the I'd like to see documentation to show that there was 0% usable open space before the work started. And I'd like to see dimensions added to the plot plan on sheet A3 uh, to show the dimensions of the proposed open spaces and the, you know, the front set back. Um, and in addition, I would like... I'm so, I'm so sorry, what, what sheet number? Dimensions sheet on the plot plan? Sheet number A3. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I would also like to see um, documentation to show that the upper story conforms to the definition of half story. So that would be that, you know, basically a floor plan with the area of that was that seven feet or more from floor to rafter. Um, and the, um, the pitches for the various roof surfaces. So compliance to the minimum two and 12? Yes. Yes. And when he asks that, that may mean that that may be a potential change that you may need to, to look into. But again, we, we can't tell from the, some of the limited information we have. So I just want to make that clear. And would we add overall to that to make sure that's locked in? There was some question. It can't. Sorry, go ahead. So, I mean, if you if you want to add if you want to add that, um, there was a sheet with elevations on it somewhere, and I did not, and I failed to notice. But yeah, if you if you could put it on a drawing, that would be great. I could have sworn, and maybe you know what, I may have hesitated because I was looking for more information. But Kelly, please help me with this remembering. Um, did I submit an attic plan with the red and the purple? You did, but I followed up because there weren't dimensions on the areas that okay. were included in the red versus okay. the purple, and the okay, roof slope was a shell. That was so. the reason, yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes, Steve. Uh, so sheet A6 does have elevations, but um, it doesn't. It shows the elevations of the floors, but it doesn't show a final elevation of the roof. So if you could, if you could add it, that would be great. Okay, anything else? Nope. Okay, while we're on uh, 
potential asks for additional information. Um, any other members of the board uh, with additional asks? Gross floor Gross area. Gross floor area, uh, uh, including the basement. In the basement, I also like to understand how they calculated the first floor and the second floor. If you could show that also. Just so I can, so I can hear that correctly. Uh, how you calculated the other floors as well as the basement and how you calculated it for the um, gross floor area of the building. And then a new total calculation and a new... Um, Overall F FLA? F FAR. FAR, F -A -R. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we'd like, I'd like to see where the bicycle parking is going to be shown. And short term and long term. Short term and long term. Um, and the screening on the left side of the parking in the, where it's required next to the other, other property on the left side. And I agree with Steve about the, the attic. Okay, uh, Ken, any additional information, clarification that you're looking for? Uh, just which way, how they can treat that open space to maintain open space. Okay. Uh, so the curb or perimeter condition of the open space as it abuts the paved surface. Yeah, like bushes or, yep. you know, or uh, some sort of transition and elevation, however they want to handle it, you know. Okay. Um, did they, uh, did you, did Jean cover the uh, car parking screening? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I think Steve had his hand raised. I'm Sorry, I'm still, still taking notes. Go no, ahead. No, 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 Please go ahead, Steve. To come around. Um, did you get? I don't think you've got oh. yet. You, I think you said you didn't. Did you have anything? That, um, no, I guess I had a, uh, some questions for the board or like Ken and yourself, Madam Chair. Yes. In terms of um, what one of the public comments around the fencing at the front. Um, I was thinking about that when we were down there in terms of design, so now it's kind of coming through here. But um, uh, the, the wood fencing and some of that, um, the other project that was completed, um, to me, it doesn't maybe as relate to my, as much to the house design. And then, so I was thinking with regard to it being, you know, bigger in the FAR, that is there an opportunity to use the fencing as an opportunity for more green? So could we look at like a different way to divide those properties through landscape design? Is that something that... I think we could ask the applicant con to consider it, but I would consider that outside of our purview, but we could certainly ask them to consider it. Yes, because I think it would offer some opportunity to add you know, just more planting to greenify the area, um, maybe make it less imposing as it, you know, as you're walking down there. Because if you imagine every project down that street redeveloped in such the same manner, it becomes more of a wall of fencing, and maybe we can think of how we can so do an something alternate better. to the stocking yeah. fencing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's um, one thing, and then I think everything else was covered. Okay, and then um, before we move to, I think that there were a few other questions I want to come back to, like the window wells, et cetera, where I want to make sure we give them an interpretation as to how we're looking at, at that as a board. Did you have any questions as to the items that were requested um, for additional information for a future hearing? And what we can also do is follow up with Kelly um, can follow up with you for this list that we've been keeping as well to make sure that we're in alignment. Yeah, I always like to compare lists. Absolutely. Uh, so back. Uh, first, let me just make sure oh, that he okay. doesn't have any additional questions. So we, we do have some thoughts on sure. our calculations. Sure. So it might be better to just work on that. Okay. But clearly, we're heading to a second hearing session with some updated materials and some things to find. And there yes. are several asks and some of the comments that make that easy for us to do. Um, 
So we'll probably get familiar with that after the Okay. That sounds good. I heard okay from Chris. So okay. I don't okay, great. Thank you. Steve. No, I, I just wanted to, one was wanted to spend a minute talking about long-term bicycle parking. So typically in an apartment, the long-term bicycle parking is provided at great access and it's a shared, in a shared <clears> space. <throat> In this case, every dwelling unit is, has its own at-grade access, and there is no interior shared spaces. Um, I'm kind of questioning whether long-term makes sense. Except the basement. They could put it in the basement. The, base, the basement is, is not a shared area. No, but each, each, each um, unit has its own space in the basement, so they could clearly put it down there. Okay. And even though Technically, we don't like them to go up and down stairs. We can allow that in this situation. So I think I'm hearing there show long-term bike parking that's possible. It's inside the structure in the basement. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It would need to be inside the structure. In the storage the area. In the storage area. Makes sense. Great. Okay. So there was a question about the um, calculation of the setback related to the, the window wells and Gene um, that was specific to section I just had it 5.3.9 B Steve is this something that during your tenure on the ZBA since these are not, window wells are not typically not pieces that we <laughs> run into in the ARB no the all of the applications of um, 539 that I have yes. personally dealt with <clears throat> involve porches and vestibules. So this, never window wells. This is how I read it. So the, the issue too is I think the setback requirement is 20 feet. They are at 20.7 I think. So it's possible that even with the window well they'll still be within we just need the, so again, this is another, this, we need documentation. We need documentation okay. about whether the window well is in the 20 foot setback or not. And then if it's in the 20 foot setback, we'll have to figure out what to do with it. But I was, I, I mean, I didn't go out there with a tape measure, so I couldn't measure it. So I'm not sure whether it goes into the setback or not. Great. Great job, can I make a comment? Please. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. I said yes. Oh, I, 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 you want to be. I think I was talking as I was writing, so my apologies. Yes, no, please do. Not, Go ahead. Say something to you. Say over. Oh. No. Um, these buildings aren't sprinkled, right? It, it is sprinkled. It is sprinkled. That's why you you you're, you get one means of egress, and that's fine, right? Okay. Uh, I was going to allude to it. if the spill if the unit was was not sprinkled, then you need two means of egress out of the basement because. Uh, it's an occupied space, but I believe you guys are treating it as a non-occupied space. That's why you, that's why you're not counting it as your FAR. But they have to count it as the FAR. Uh, I, I realize because of certain regulations, okay. <laughs> but if it's not uh, occupied, if it's non-occupied space, then it doesn't count as FAR. And the reason why it's counting as FAR is because it's you got eight foot high clear in there, something like that. If it, was, if it was lower than seven feet, then it's no longer considered mm -hmm. occupied space. No, Is that correct, that's, Steve? That, that's correct. That, okay. That's not how... I'm going to let the architect look at that too, okay? That's Have not you looked how at that? The, that's not how this is framed. Well, I, I have to look at that again, okay? But what I'm saying is usually occupied spaces has to do with height. Yes. And if it's less than a certain amount of height, it's no longer counted as occupied space anymore, and it's, it's considered storage. And so if it's considered storage because of its height, then you don't need e egress, you don't need to count this FAR because it's, it's just plain storage. Well, no, we, we've determined that we need to count it, correct, Steve, so, in the well, way that you've been calculating it as well with the CBA? So my, my understanding is it, as long as it is seven feet tall, if it's, it gets a, counted. If it's a crawl space, you know, um, if it's not, you know, if it, you know, if it's too short, then it's not counted. Right. Right. I'm just trying to give you guys options to look at certain things when you look at this. Okay, I'm not trying to say what is what, or I'm not giving you direction what to do. 
and just I'm looking at the interpretation of what we have here, and if Gene is saying this is occupied space because it's, it meets all the criteria, then it has to count as the FAR. But when you took an approach, it was not FAR, so you didn't count it in your schedule there because, so you're, you're not building occupied space here. I'm just stating that right now. So I think what we're being asked is basically sharpen our pencil and be yes. bring some details on FAR. And I will note, I didn't note at the beginning here, I should have, Bob and Nessie is their, is their uh, local council who you're familiar with, very yes. familiar with the Arlington uh, Zoning Bylaw much more than myself. Um, so we'll be consulting with him. He's actually very ill. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. He's nice enough to do a phone call with oh. us and I can manage. He's Please pass on our wishes for recovery. Yeah. Very diligent on the project uh, with us, and, um, and so we'll contact him, and we'll probably contact the building inspector as well, who should be the first sure. line of uh, Great. I, and we can also ask the building inspector how he considers the absolutely the, yep the window wells yeah, on the window well question too. Yeah. Great. Uh, any other questions or uh, commentary from the board? To, uh, that, the early comment I had about how we interpret this project? Uh, sure, I mean, if there's a question you'd like to, to pose to us, sure. Yes, because I'm just saying, you know, when I view this project, I'm viewing it in this terms of how it, the ARB would view it. That's why I talk about fencing, bicycle parking, and all, and all the other open space, not as terms of um, how the zoning board would view it. You know, uh, certain the zone board has certain requirements how they would give relief. They give relief because it's uh, um, uh, they have to meet two of the requirements, I believe, right, Steve? Um, non conforming site or weird site is, is one way of giving re relief. It's historic, is another way of giving relief. And you have to make certain requirements to get that relief. Our charge is a little more broader than that, and our charge is trying to follow the master plan with ACE a certain way of encouraging. So I just want to see if there's more projects come up this way here, that we're more prepared to talk about this. And you know, I don't want to see this as a one-off. Yes, this is unfortunate situation, and, and I, feel, I feel badly for it. But I still want to set a tone saying how we should view things, and we should discuss it now. So in the future, we're, we have a sort of a uh, you know, we'll help people see how, how we would do things. And, I, I, you know, and it's important to me where we, we have to follow what we've been chartered with, which is to, to encourage good development. And that's, is, and we're empowered to give some relief to, to, to obtain that. And, you know, our opinions may differ for what is good development or what is what, but I'm okay with that. That's why I think it's a good community here. We have this difference of opinion, and I, I value that. But, it's, but the fundamental, fundamentals about how we view this is very important to me. So I, I hear, so I'll, I'll start first. I, I hear what you're saying. I think that um, this is a very unusual project, given the fact that it is um, a four-family, pre-existing non-conforming use in an R2, none of which we ever would typically yes. hear. Um, so I think that we do need to, um, we do need to align with the re re requirements um, to a certain extent while also again keeping our charge, which is looking at does this building, um, to the point that you pointed out, Gene, um, create a um, basically a, a betterment to the to the community based on the definition that's in the environment the environmental design review criteria um, and much like again we look at properties that um, create a larger area of open space and perhaps are required. You know, there's, there is some, some give and, and take, but there are some areas here which I think are, again, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the documentation on how close or whether they do fall into compliance before I think we can really talk about what we would trade off 
I think we're, we're still struggling a little bit to understand where our baseline oh, that is a little bit. That part I totally understand, and I'm, I'm with you guys. I just want to get a, a, a broader understanding of how we're going to view it. That's all. Okay. So that, that's how I'm planning on looking at it, I is I think it. that there are... Um, yep. Yeah. Anyone else want to weigh in, Steve? Yeah, but, yeah. Oh, sorry, Melissa, go ahead. Um, well, I mean, I think... I think, Ken, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, I think what you're trying to say is I explain a little bit more of the scope and the purview of the ARB, um, different than some of the other regulatory boards. Um, I think some of the you know, public a comment that we heard sounded like there was a little confusion and that where we do offer some relief, the idea, the relief is for the greater good, the master plan, that's our charge, and it's supposed to encourage, you know, the best possible project, design-wise, environment-wise, transportation-wise. And so that's where there's a little wiggle room or what you call, you know, relief for some of the rules. It's not a black and white book, check off, check off, and then it moves on. So that's why the board exists, and then that's why there's also the range of opinion I think you hear from us and how, where that wiggle room or how much of that we're okay with as a collective board. So I just want to say I hear you, Ken, and that makes that makes sense to me. And I think um, you know that's part of the dialogue, right? Part yes. of our conversation. Steve. So I, yeah, I there's a question I'd like to pose to the uh, to the rest of my fellow board members and to Ms. Linema. Um And this is sort of a a question of bylaw interpretation. So in the dimensional and density regulations that specify an, a maximum FAR of 0.35, that maximum FAR is, applies to, quote unquote, any permitted structure. Over the weekend, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the word permitted meant in this context. And I came up with two possible interpretations, and I'm wondering if how you guys feel about them, or which one you'd prefer, or if there's, if it's something else. <clears throat> so one way to inter I think to interpret it would be permitted as in um, can be given a building permit. And in, you know, this is clearly a case that would you know, basically, basically covers pretty much everything. <clears throat> the other way to interpret the word permitted is permitted under this bylaw, mm -hmm. which would mean that a conforming building um, or building a structure that conforms to the bylaw would be limited, but a pre-existing non-conforming structure would not necessarily be. This is sort of like the way we treat non-conformities with respect to usable open space. So what, my, basically what I'm, I'm wondering, I'm sort of asking in a roundabout way, is does that FAR requirement even apply to this project? So it's either a permitted structure mm -hmm. or it's what? So it's so it's either it depends on how you interpret the word permitted. Yeah. So if you think of permit as, you know, a building permit, then sure it applies to everything. But if you think of permitted it as does this bylaw allow it? Well here you have something that the bylaw doesn't allow but is pre existing non conforming. So then it would be a permit. Yes. That's what I was getting at too, Steve. And I think you know what my opinion was. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't think we should apply it, but that's that's just because it's within. I believe it's within our purview mm -hmm. to do that. Because I really think this is a betterment. This building is a betterment to the neighborhood. There's a few things we are going to tweak, but in general, it's a betterment for the neighborhood. And that's how I view it as an ARB board member, as opposed to a zoning board member. So my take on it is that it is an other permitted structure and the FAR does apply to it because if it wasn't there would be so many structures that didn't have any didn't have applicability here and all the other sections that talk about what you can do to adjust the nonconformities wouldn't matter anymore so I think it definitely does, my opinion is, it definitely does apply mm -hmm. to it. Um, and this is, 
this is an interesting situation to me because if this didn't have just a few feet on the bike path, you know, at the back mm -hmm. where there's going to be parking and a little green space, it would have gone to the Zoning Board of Appeals rather than to us, and they would have made the decision on 3.3 and not on the Environmental Design Review. So my thought is, because it just happens to go to us, because there's a few more feet on the bikeway, does that mean it should get um, an extra benefit that it wouldn't get if it wasn't on a bikeway? And my feeling is it should not. That while we could apply the EDR criteria and we need to, I would ac apply them very narrowly because I believe that it shouldn't sort of get something that it couldn't have gotten if it was in front of the ZBA mm -hmm. simply because it had a few feet on the bikeway. That's the way I look at it. Um, so I'm unlikely to go beyond what is written here. Mm -hmm. However, what is written here does allow us to adjust those things, because if you look at 8.1.8, .8, which is what I was asking the public folks, it's the one that, you know, specifically says, not substantially more detrimental mm -hmm. than the existing non-conforming structure or use to the neighborhood. Um, so it's not, we don't have to go to 3.4, the EDR, we can go to the direct mm -hmm. piece of it. What what concerns me, and I just think about this because I haven't quite made up my mind, but it relates to something that some of the public comments were. What concerns me about this, with the potential of increasing the FAR or allowing the increase, is then a lot of those buildings are non-conforming. So what we're doing have rolling, rolling, rolling increases of the FAR, and it sort of becomes meaningless yeah, at that the, point. The reason I brought it up is because, yeah. you know, buildings with no usable open space. So normally on a conforming lot, right. the because open space is based on FAR, you know, it will constrain the size of the building. Right. But if you start with zero percent usable open space and there's there's a lot there's a lot there are a huge yeah. number of properties that fall into this category, you know, there is no constraint whatsoever. You know, and that's you know that's just happens to be how the yeah. how the bylaw works and how it's been interpreted. Yeah. So um, I mean, you know, I, I need to think this a little more and hear what the others you have to say, but I'm leaning toward saying that they can't go beyond what the current building is when it comes to FAR because of the fact that I think it's sort of you know the slippery slope thing for Belknap Street. And once we do this, then it starts to become precedent for others. And um, I, I also, I wonder whether the ZBA has dealt with this. Because mm -hmm. if the ZBA has a standard about what they do with this, I would really like to know. Oh, yeah. That would really inform my decision. Pre right precedent there. is a wonderful thing. Yeah, so do we know what the ZBA has done well, with this Why don't before? we do this? I will. Um, Meet with Christian Klein, right, right. and I will Terrific. I will um, get a um, consensus get a from him. From yep. Him on this. Thanks. I think this is we both I, I agree your points. So and, and I'm sorry, can Melissa did oh, have a sorry, comment to I make apologize. next? Oh, Madam Chair. So well, I guess one thing, um, Jean, in in your thinking, as a one-off property, I understand the thinking. Um, but if you're looking at the whole and saying, assuming the other properties down Belknap, I'm trying to gauge how many touch Minuteman bikeway. I think would, in they, would, would they come before us next time? I think that side of the street, they would. all touch Every, Minuteman bikeway. They all touch Minuteman yeah. bikeway. Yeah, so assuming 22 side. Belknap, yeah, it looked like that, and again, that's assuming that they are looking for relief. If they're within, right, they would not 
if come they're not the increasing the nonconformity. Correct. Right. Correct. If they're not increasing it, but if right. imagining another project coming before us, touching Minuteman, right. and along that corridor, I guess what I'm thinking is, as a whole, if we are able to do that and apply the EDR, the Environmental Design Review criteria, each time, it's not necessarily. You know, we are not the ZBA, in so much, in so much that as a whole, for the projects along the Minuteman, you know, bikeway, we would be improving them, and we would have the ability to have that, versus trying to, you know, emulate the um, ZBRA. Yeah. All, all, all true, but I just, it just seems odd to me that because one side of Belknap, you know, but that's has the, the backyards to has yeah. the backyards on. <laughs> Minuteman and the other side doesn't, that they would be treated differently. That's why I'm really interested well, that, in what I mean, the ZBA would do with this. I guess my sense is that just the way we oversee commercial properties is is, is the same way. You know, Except it's, it's no geographic ZBA. location right. based on what's important to the community. The open right. space, the linear park, that's Minuteman Bikeway, the commercial districts, and these are important to us so they come through this right. board. Agreed. Excellent discussion. Did you have a comment, Kim, before we No, I think this is, these are good discussions that I think we can table and talk more about at the retreat we're going to talk about later on. <laughs> right. and I, I, I think this, these are things <clears throat> that I think we should, should have an, a, a bit of discussion about. This project does bring up a good point. Uh, unfortunately, I, I feel for you guys, and you know, most likely we're going to ask you to come back with a few more questions. And I apologize to have to drag you through all this stuff because it's none of your fault, but it is what it is. Hopefully that. It is a little bit. Okay. Yeah, a little okay. bit. Okay. So, a um, bit right. Complete <laughs> so um, we have a list for you, which we enumerated previously. We will review that with Kelly. Um, what I'd like to do is um, request a motion from the board to continue the hearing. And what I first need to do is coordinate a date with you and with Kelly looking at the future ARB meeting date. So do you have those, Kelly, so that we can give them some options? Yes, so if they are able to turn around, the board is taking, the board is not meeting in the month of August. So if you are able to turn around any feedback or changes or responses by Wednesday, July 20, we could have this be part of the hearing on the 25th. Yeah, July 25. Yes. Otherwise, we're looking at September 12th, I believe. You need to submit it before no. the 25th. Yes. Yeah, that's why I said the 20th. Okay. Yeah. I can, I can probably answer this without asking the, the man is is there a better issue for the 25th? Okay. Okay, the, the other options are, sorry, the 12th of September or the 26th of September. So I said we're going to want to shoot the 25th, and if that is, uh, proves impossible, the 12th, or the 12th of September, or the 26th. Well, so if that date approaches and you find that you are not ready to submit on July 20th, please just let Kelly know as far in advance as you can, and we'll adjust the, um, what we'll do is we'll need to vote on um, the 25th in your absence to continue the hearing again to the September date. Absolutely. But that is not a problem if that turns out to be what that needs to what needs and to happen. I will confirm those deadlines when I follow up with a list of items. So, so I'll move that we continue um, this hearing docket 3704 to July 25th, 2022. I'll second that. Great. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a vote starting with uh, Steve. Yes. Melissa. Yes. I'm a yes? Yes. Kim? Yes. All right, so that unanimously is continued um, to, uh, excuse me, docket number 3704 is unanimously continued to July 25th. Thank you very much for being us with us this evening. Thank you for your time. Yeah, appreciate you, it. Thank you. Thank you. Also appreciate the help of uh, town staff. Kelly's been super communicating with us. Pretty We're much. very lucky to have We're Kelly, to have so them. thank you very much <laughs> for that acknowledgement. Thank you. Okay. Give me one second while I get back to my agenda.
All right, so the next um, item on our agenda, agenda item number two, is the discussion of the dates for the fall board retreat. So um, we had identified that we would like to try and meet in uh, September or October, hopefully after the new um, uh, department uh, head is selected. Um, so what I think would be a good idea now is to just try and collect a series of, of potential dates. Um, probably towards the latter half of September, if we're going to be safe, just knowing, not knowing currently what the timing is going to look like um, fully yet for the selection. Um, so maybe what we could do is start by identifying the days um, that are not available. So we know that town day is the 17th, which is probably not a great day for us to do our board retreat because I'd like everybody to enjoy the first town day in a That'd couple of years. Right? Um, so, I mean, I feel like the 10th, 11th, that weekend is probably a little early. That's right after Labor Day and the new um, um, department head will probably still be settling in. Um, so, do we want to throw out either the 18th, the 24th, or the 25th? Is there anyone who cannot make any of those dates? I work? cannot make the 18th. Okay, let's take that one off. Yeah, the 24th and 25th are probably better for me because I want to go away in September, but earlier is more likely. Okay. What are those dates again? Uh, September 24th or 25th? Saturday or Sunday? That's a Saturday or Sunday? Yeah, that's fine. I'm okay. Okay. I cannot do the following weekend, but if we need to push to October, um, the next date, actually, what is Columbus? Columbus Day is the 10th, um, but the 8th, 9th, right before Columbus Day would be the next weekend. So do we want to take that off the table if the 24th, 25th, one of those two dates does not work? Or people find to meet on a Columbus Day? I like to see if we leave it in September. You can't do if, 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 if that's we possible. Usually, we go away. We don't have time. usually in, okay. We push it so far back that we do, we don't get enough chance to. Review the I understand. Project. I'm just trying to give us options because yeah. again, we don't know when um, the new uh, department head is going to be selected. I see. Okay. I, I hope that we can do either the 24th or the 25th. That is. That's my goal, but I want to have a backup. Um, and so maybe I think the 15th, 6th, we're going to have to look to October 15th or 16th. If Is the first and second don't work of October? I, I'm, I'm going oh, to be out of town. Okay. okay. Okay, that's all right. Okay. So okay. far, October 15th, 16th looks like a backup. Okay. Um, and as the dates approach, we can um, work on an agenda for that meeting. All right, anything else on agenda item number two, the board retreat? Nope. All right, next we'll go to agenda item number three, which is open forum, which I will invite <laughs> members of the public, but there are none here, so we will go ahead and close agenda item number three, which is the open forum. Um, and uh, I'll see if there's any other new business. No, nope. then I'll see if there is a motion to adjourn this evening. So motion. Second. All right, we'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We're now adjourned. Yes.